Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to see how acroflavine fights COVID. This work was published by the Sattler, Hadian, Popovich and Pirk groups in Cell Chemical Biology and reports their work of using acroflavine, which is a clinically approved drug, to fight COVID. The COVID infection process starts with the entry of a virus particle into a cell, either through endosomes or by binding to the AS2 receptor. Once inside the cell, it releases its contents and the translation of viral replication machinery occurs. Once these are translated, it enters the replication phase and begins to make copies of its RNA. Together with structural proteins, these are assembled into a new virus particle, which is released and can go on to infect other cells or other hosts. Antiviral drugs often target the translation and replication stages of the virus life cycle, such as Paxlovid, which targets the 3CL protease, or Molnupiravir, which acts at the replication stage of the virus life cycle. In this video, we will look at acroflavine, which as we will see, targets the PL protease. So what is acroflavine? It is commonly sold as a mixture of methylated triploflavines and proflavines, and was first developed in 1912 by Paul Ehrlich. It has been used to treat a variety of illnesses, including sleeping sickness, urinary tract infections and gonorrhea. Most importantly for its use as a Covid drug is that it has already proven to be safe for use in humans. The researchers identified this drug using high throughput screening where they tested over 5,000 clinically approved compounds for PL-PRO inhibition activity using both the RLRGG and the ISG15 AMC fluorogenic probes. In these tests, acroflavine stood out as one of the most potent inhibitors, showing IC50 values of just over 1 micromolar. They confirmed this inhibition using Western blot analysis. In these experiments, they observed the inhibition of the cleavage of triubiquitin to diubiquitin in the presence of acroflavine. With this inhibitor now identified, they sought to examine the binding interactions between acroflavine and the PL protease. They first carried out two-dimensional Trozzi NMR experiments. This method uses transverse relaxation optimized spectroscopy to show the coupling between nitrogen and hydrogen atoms. They first recorded the spectrum of the PL protease in isolation and then with increasing amounts of acroflavine added. The area of the spectrum corresponding to the amide NH signals showed almost no difference upon addition of acroflavine, indicating that the structure of the enzyme is largely unchanged. However, a small number of these signals did show a shift, indicating that acroflavine is binding to the enzyme in solution. The researchers were able to determine the precise interactions between the protease and the drug molecules by growing crystals of proflavine bound to the PL protease. These structures showed that there are two molecules of proflavine in the S3, S4 and S5 pockets of the substrate recognition cleft, and these interact with each other through pi pi stacking interactions. The first molecule of proflavine occupies the S4 pocket, while the second molecule occupies the S3 and S5 pockets. These interact with the enzyme through primarily pi pi interactions, both through parallel pi stacking and through perpendicular pi CH bond interactions. In addition, the second proflavine molecule also forms electrostatic interactions through the primary amine groups and the central pyridine type nitrogen. The binding of proflavine to the enzyme induces a slight distortion of the molecular structure. In the structure shown here in yellow, we can see the conformation of the enzyme without proflavine present. The structure shown in grey shows the enzyme with the drug bound. We can see quite clearly that the BL2 loop rotates by about 57 degrees and moves tyrosine 268 about two angstroms closer to the drug, allowing it to form T-shaped pi stacking interactions. We can compare this proflavine binding mode to the binding of the RLRGG recognition motif, which also binds to this substrate binding site. This comparison shows a very similar binding mode, with the nitrogens occupying the P3 and P4 binding sites. Importantly, the nitrogen in the P4 site is not involved in any polar interactions. This suggests that the N-methylated acroflavine should still be able to bind at this site, and may even be preferred as the methyl group will not suffer from the same desolvation penalty as the free amine. 
In addition, the alkyl chain of the RLRGG recognition motif extends deep into the P2 pocket, which means that the side methylated molecules, also present in the acroflavine mixture, should be easily accommodated at these positions. So let's move on and look at the in vitro studies. They first determined the cytotoxicity using A549 and Vero cells. The A549 cells overexpress the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is a key receptor in the SARS CoV 2 infection process. Acroflavine was well tolerated in both of these cell lines, showing CC50 values in the micromolar range. They then examined the efficacy of acroflavine in these two cell lines by comparing the virus yield of the cells treated with acroflavine with the negative control which had not been treated with any drug. They also included a positive control which was treated with a 10 micromolar solution of remdesivir. By comparing the inhibitory concentrations with the cytotoxic concentrations, they could work out the selectivity indices, which was 36 in the AF549 cells and 53 in the Vero cells. This indicates that acroflavine is a highly selective therapy and is not expected to show cytotoxicity at therapeutic concentrations. They next examined the effect that the time of the addition has on its antiviral efficacy. These studies found that it retained its efficacy even when administered up to six hours post-infection. This indicates that it acts during the replication phase and not the initial infection phase. They were able to visualize this antiviral activity by using confocal microscopy. In these experiments, they recorded images of cells 24 and 48 hours after infection. These cells were grown in the presence or absence of acroflavine or remdesivir, and the researchers could selectively stain different proteins to visualize the virus. In these images, we can see the cell nuclei stained blue, actin, which is present in the cytoskeleton, as red, and the viral nucleocapsid protein in green. In the control samples, which had no drugs present, we can clearly see the presence of the virus, visible as the green color on the outside of the cells. In the samples treated with acroflavine and remdesivir, we can see an almost complete elimination of this virus. These confocal microscopy experiments were also carried out in an ex vivo model. These studies used human airway epithelium cells and the images were taken six days after infection with SARS-CoV-2. As was seen in the previous studies, the sample treated with acroflavine shows almost a complete elimination of the virus. The remdesivir sample also shows an inhibition of the virus the viral particles can still clearly be seen on the surface of the cells. In order to see if acroflavine had broad activity against different beta coronaviruses, they carried out assays using MERS-CoV and HCoV OC43, which are other beta coronaviruses that also contain the PL protease. Acroflavine showed efficacy against both of these viruses. However, it did not show efficacy against feline infectious peritonitis virus nor HCoV NL63. This is likely because the PL protease present in these viruses lack a stretch of 40 amino acids that are present in the site that binds to proflavine. Having determined how the drug interacts with the enzyme, the researchers then studied the pharmacokinetics. The acroflavine drug mixtures were administered to mice using IV and oral administration and samples were taken at different time points and the concentration of the molecules present were determined. These experiments showed a high bioavailability, with the lungs showing higher and more stable levels of the drug over time. These studies showed that proflavine and its side methylated analogues have a much greater bioavailability than acroflavine, and most importantly, that the levels that they observed were much higher than the in vitro therapeutic dose, suggesting that it should have antiviral activity in humans. In the final experiments of this work, they carried out in vivo studies using mice, Groups of 10 mice were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and they received treatment of oral acroflavine once per day or twice daily intramuscular injections in addition to the negative control group and the positive control group which received remdesivir. This treatment was continued for 6 days after which the virus yields were determined. All of the mice survived until the end of the study and did not show any signs of disease such as weight loss. The group that received acroflavine showed an almost complete elimination of the virus in the brain tissue, while also showing a reduction of the virus in the lungs, though this is not as significant as the reduction seen in the brain tissue. Overall, these studies show that acroflavine has potential for use as an anti-COVID agent 
and as a drug against other beta coronaviruses and will likely see further study due to its proven safety in humans. Well that's everything for this week. In the next video we will look at the total synthesis of Toxicode DNA.